Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 7th. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. Our first mission is the attempted recovery of a Dragon Capsule. Previously, we had attempted to bring back down a Dragon Capsule uncrewed, but that didn't work, it, it blew up. Uh, so we need to fix things up and try it again, so I'm tucking in the thrusters and we're going to try a different approach, but we have to do it with Kerbals in because that's the only way we can control it. So here's Dragon version 2 launching on a Falcon 9. And again, the video will be sped up to match real time and engine sounds are added after the fact. Aside from tucking in the Super Dracos to where they ought to be, I haven't really made any changes to the capsule itself, so we still have the docking port on top which overheated. That's an overheating issue because it's clipping into the capsule at the top. We haven't made any changes to the parachute yet. I intend to fix the, the max temp on certain parts if this doesn't go well, but uh, we'll see how it goes. The idea is to get this to a relatively low orbit, around 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers, and then have it descend uh, with a periapsis of about 82 kilometers. That should be fairly gentle. So here we go. Uh, we will reserve fuel in the first stage to simulate recovery. And there we go. Second stage is lit. Still haven't fixed the plume on that yet, but uh, we are going through practical things here. Uh, I'll worry about the visuals later on because, well, it's most important that we figure out how the systems will work. And so here the Dragon version 2 proceeds up. Now the Dragon version 2 can carry up to 7 people, but it requires 2 crew in order to operate it. So it will be our main way of getting crew into orbit. Whether we're going to be interested in bringing them back is, is an interesting question we will delve into starting at the end of the next episode. But the assumption is that we are going to be bringing them back at this point. Alright, so uh, here we go. The second stage is about to run out here, but we are reaching orbit. A little bit lopsided because we were already descending and I didn't quite manage the ascent as I normally do, but we can correct that because the second stage has relights and we have plenty of extra delta V even though it doesn't look like much fuel because that last little bit of fuel contains a lot of delta V. So first, lowering apoapsis. And that's all we need. And then we'll head on over to apoapsis to raise the periapsis a little bit before we jettison the second stage. So this is that maneuver. Obviously having to settle the fuel down using the RCS system. And that's that. So after that we can discard the second stage. That's the next order of business. And off it goes. Remember we had to put an extra decoupler in there to make that work out. And now we've got the capsule in the trunk. Before I let go of the trunk, I check everything is all right, fix the parachutes and make sure it's pressure based and it will pre-deploy at 0.3 atmospheres. Also before we let go of the trunk, we should do the retro burn. After all, we want the trunk to also re-enter. And so I use RCS for this. I could have used the Super Dracos, but I was reserving them for... Eh, for the sake of realism, normally the Super Dracos are only used on touchdown anyway. So here we go, and you can see the location of the capsule at this retro burn point in the middle of the Pacific. And we're aiming for target periapsis. Somebody in the Twitch chat uh, mentioned that we should deorbit the second stage because it does have a controller on the top of it. And that would be the best thing to do. However, there is a slight problem. It doesn't have any RCS. Now, with persistent rotation, it'll ultimately rotate itself to face retrograde, and here I time warp and let it do that. But there is another problem, the propellant is very unstable, and only RCS will be able to stabilize it. So we, we see how it turns around, hoping that it's stable when we get there. But when we get to retrograde, or close enough to retrograde to retro burn here, we see that it's still very unstable, so we can't do the retro burn and can't bring it down. Okay, back with the capsule, I checked that the trunk doesn't have anything important in it. And then separate. And there it goes. So, so far so good. And the capsule hits the atmosphere 
over the Gulf of Mexico and so that's Louisiana in the background and uh, we're aiming for the South Atlantic for our touchdown point this time. If we wanted to aim for around Cape Canaveral or close to Florida we would probably want to retro burn around Australia or between Australia and Hawaii not as far over the Pacific as we did. Okay so uh, here we start to see a marker and that's actually the capsule itself, I think. Remember, the heat shield is not separate from the capsule. It's integrated with the capsule, so I guess that's what... But it doesn't seem to be increasing in heat very much, so it seems to be all right. Now, as we go lower, we start to get another marker, and that seems to be the docking port at the top that's clipped into the, to the capsule, so that's a bit more of a worry. And that, of course, can carry heat throughout the vehicle, but as we descend below 40 kilometers and hit our max g-force, it seems to be all right. Okay, and we are through the region of heating, g-forces coming down, and actually the docking port is still intact. So that's pretty impressive. It looks like this is a safe trajectory to use, and really tucking in the Super Dracos was the main thing to do. So uh, here we have the parachute. I don't think it's a good idea to try and bring this capsule from a greater height though. Sorry, uh, no splash sound. I couldn't find where the splash sound was in the, in the sound effects in KSP. So anyway, we brought our two kerbals back and so that's the important thing. Next I took a brief detour and checked on our station and especially a centrifuge module which always starts out undeployed. Even though it looks deployed, it always starts out undeployed when you leave it. And I have fixed the crew issue. There was one little bit in the configuration file. So now it can take crew and I transfer a crew member to it. And that crew member is in there. But there's still a problem. For some reason that I couldn't figure out in the configuration files, that crew member is not exercising. It says cramped instead. And so even though this module, when you right click on it, says that the activity level is exercising, the crew member is not exercising. So I move the, try to move the crew member out. I dumped connected living space in order to allow us to do this instead of having them EVA. But it turns out, even then, I wasn't able to move the crew member to the new, to the different modules. So I don't know what's going on there. Sometimes it lets me move them, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, next mission. Testing the Moon Chaser and seeing if we can recover that. Now I don't want to use Jeb and Bill. I decided to recruit a new pilot especially for this mission because it's very dangerous. Uh, recovering Moon Chaser, I don't know. Moon Chaser is meant to be able to go to the moon if you refuel it in orbit. So right now on the Falcon 9 that it launches on, it's only partially fueled. It's only got uh, maneuvering fuel here to reach a station where it can refuel. Okay, Falcon 9 lit and launch. So it's right at the capacity for the Falcon 9 right now. It's carrying as much fuel as it can without overburdening the Falcon 9. And so we'll need to burn out the first stage of Falcon 9. We're not reserving any fuel for recovery in this case. So yeah, you can see the huge amount of empty MMH and N204. If that was full up, then the Dream, uh, Dream Chaser is named after Dream Chaser. Then Moon Chaser can transfer to the moon. And it uses Super Dracos. Its, uh, its own engines are Super Dracos and it also has two uh, kilonewton thrusters, two two kilonewton thrusters, so four kilonewtons on those. And those are actually used to sell down the fuel for the Super Dracos, though it also has RCS. Okay, so here's the first stage uh, coming to its completion. I still left the lander legs on, even though I shouldn't have done that. Okay, that's off. Separation and second stage lit. And this is the long part, of course. The second stage takes a while, but there you go. That's uh, that's Moon Chaser right there. It can carry six crew, and that's its main duty. It does have a small cargo bay, and that's a bit of a problem because the stuff in the cargo bay tends to explode on re-entry. Um, here you see it has extendable RCS booms from the stock extension pack, and that's necessary to allow it to roll like this. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't have much roll control because all of the RCS is very close to the body and actually on top. None of the RCS is on the bottom or anything like that. Okay, and so we're going to have a little bit of a trick with pitch control. We'll see how that works out. Okay, coasting right along. It looks pretty good in this sort of uh, pose, if you will. There's the east coast of the United States. And 
we are headed back down, but that's nominal. Uh, we'll reach a fairly high orbit and we'll have to bring it down. Similar to the adjustments we made with the other one. Yeah, really high. 500 kilometer apoapsis there. But off goes the second stage. That's not gonna re-enter. So again, we've left a few stages in orbit. But uh, here I'm uh, rearranging the thrusters and now I'm going to make the orbital adjustments. Our periapsis is fine at this time. I used RCS to correct that and now I'm using the Super Dracos. Actually, I start off with the two kilonewton thrusters trying to use them to bring down the apoapsis. But ultimately, I decided to use the Super Dracos because the two kilonewton thrusters were taking too long. So there we go. Uh, so that's a nice standard orbit and we will uh, begin a deorbit burn. So for, uh, for a craft like the Moon Chaser, you generally want to aim for a periapsis that's lower than a capsule would aim for because this generates lift. What we don't want to have happen here is for this to go around again, for it to skip up and uh, end up in space again. And so, and also we don't want it to be off trajectory. We're actually aiming for Florida. I do intend to bring this back down uh, to Cape Canaveral at this point. We'll see how that goes. But the, the target periapsis here is 70 kilometers, as opposed to with the capsule I was aiming for 82 kilometers. So yeah, substantially lower. Possibly uh, I should have done a little bit lower than this. But uh, here we see the heating, and that's the other balance, right? You can't go too low, otherwise you're going to end up getting even hotter. And also you'll face more difficulty controlling pitch. So I've I moved uh, fuel back and forth in order to control pitch. You can see the stuff in the cargo bay is very hot at this point, but a lot of the vehicle is very hot at this point. The the little uh, heat indicators don't work very well with real heat, I've found. And so they, they remain very hot for an extended period of time. Somewhere between the last little bit and this, the stuff in the cargo bay exploded. I didn't catch that. It wasn't a particularly spectacular explosion. But uh, here we are. We are in the Gulf of Mexico, well over the Gulf of Mexico thankfully, not in the Gulf of Mexico, and we are headed towards Florida, but it does look at this point like we are going to overshoot, at least people in the comments already started saying that. Uh, I thought that we were pretty well aimed for Miami. We, we don't have much cross range, this thing can't turn very well, and so we couldn't turn towards the north where, where we could hit Cape Canaveral. That would have been ideal, of course, but uh, I decided to break it down on on the first orbit around. If I really wanted to aim exactly for Cape Canaveral, uh, what I should have done was waited for a whole day. So wait 24 hours. Instead, we ended up over Miami here and a little bit too high over Miami. Uh, we're at 40 kilometers here. And so we're headed over the Atlantic. My first inclination was to try and turn around once I was able to. Of course, you can't turn around while you're still going very, very fast. The whole thing will have trouble keeping control, especially when the control surfaces are so small. Even here though, we don't have very good uh, control as you can see, we're not turning very quickly uh, and I can't really bring it to a higher bank angle. In front of us was an island in the Bahamas and already people in chat were advising me to aim for that. Uh, but I, I was still thinking about turning back towards Miami, I wouldn't be able to make it towards Cape Canaveral, but uh, taking a look at where Florida was, I decided that I really didn't have the ability to turn around, so I did in fact aim for that island in the Bahamas and try for that instead. Uh, here I have the two kilonewton thrusters on. Uh, the Super Dracos uh, had their fuel unsettled, and even with the two kilonewton thrusters right now, the fuel remained unsettled. You can see unstable right there. So I couldn't light the Super Dracos, probably not necessary to do so anyway, they're pretty high powered and uh, we didn't need all that thrust. In fact, uh, for quite a lot of the approach I was gliding. But in the end I think I probably should have at least prepared the Super Dracos, especially for touchdown, as I ultimately realized I didn't know the stall speed of this craft. You know, um, especially you know with this fuel load, I didn't really know how fast I needed to be going at touchdown and in fact as I approached the surface I did stall. So we are witnessing the stall here. I believe the stall speed is somewhere between 80 and 85 meters per second which would be reasonable for a craft with this kind of wing. And so I stall which means I lose lift and here it's just plowing into the ground. Uh, yeah. 
not good times. Not good times for our poor little Kerbal. Elemi. And... Oop. Other parts explode. But... It looks... It looks like our Kerbal may be safe. Yes, it looks like the cockpit remains intact. And so I... It takes a little bit of time to recover it though. It's a little bit twitchy. And so actually I ultimately have to recover it at the tracking station. But yeah, we got our Kerbal back. And so the test of the Moon Chaser was successful. And I can't tell you how unlikely that was actually. I was quite surprised. Uh, anyway, uh, here we are with the ISRU test. If you recall, I built this in the previous episode, in the previous streaming day. And it is launching on the, the SLS Block 1B. And so here we go for that launch. But there is a critical problem. You'll note that the controller is backwards. I'm prepared to deal with that problem. But it turns out that's not the only problem. But uh, here we go. Main engine's lit and the SRB's lit. Here we go. Now you can see a rather drastic roll occurring here. Not entirely sure why we have this roll, but it has something to do with that controller. The controller that it's controlling from is part of the planetary base ink pack, and it doesn't like this situation at all. And I should have taken this as a tip-off because later on we're gonna have trouble with that controller again. But right now it's pretty drastic so I have to stop this and revert flight. Very rare for me to revert flight but uh, since it is a peculiar problem here with that controller right there, I decided to slip in another controller with the, with the transfer package here, right there. And so Hopefully that'll be uh, facing the correct direction. Now, since that's not the root part and the whole system thinks that the other controller should be used, I have to peek into the fairing and tell it to control from the new controller. So that's what I do first. Right click and control from here. Okay, now the nav ball is facing up and we can begin again. So again, SLS Block 1B aiming for, for the moon. We've got the right inclination, ignition of the main engines for our S25 D slash E's, and the SRVs are lit and we're off. This time it looks like it's straight as an arrow and we're not having any roll problems. I I institute a uh, roll there, so Smart ASS can control the situation. At launch, the SLS has a much higher thrust weight ratio than Falcon 9, so it gets past the speed of sound uh, with relative ease. But once those boosters fall off, uh, the main engines take it a little bit easier and uh, do not peak out at a high thrust weight ratio the way the second stage of Falcon 9 does. And even worse in this case, since we're aiming for the moon, the second stage of SLS has those RL-10s, which have a total burn time of 18 minutes and 45 seconds. There's four of them, and uh, that's how long they take to uh, complete their burn for the moon with full load. And so, yeah, they'll also be finishing the burn for orbit as well. Now, part of the problem here, as we see the boosters separate, is that I'm not entirely sure I have enough fuel to land on the moon. It all depends on how much fuel we save on the second stage, how much we take of the second stage in order to in order to get to orbit, which will in turn limit how much we have left over to transfer to the moon, and so forth. Here's fairing separation, a little bit dodgy here, but it turns out alright. That that flip that they were doing, you know, could have easily collided with something, but they, they made it clear. And here is first stage out. Separation and second stage ignition. Those are the dreaded RL tends to take forever to do their thing. You can see they have more than 4,000 meters per second. They're going to use a lot of that to help us get into orbit with this heavy load. Now the ISRU unit plus the SS stage on it 
is about 54 tons if I recall correctly. But of course, part of the load to low Earth orbit is part of the second stage, you know, the part of the second stage that is going to make the transfer, or start the transfer at least. So the actual total load to orbit is very high. Actually, I don't think SLS Block 1B can launch 54 tons to the moon, it's really a stretch. Uh, we'll see how it does, but uh, it was never meant for that kind of load. Probably even 45 tons would be a stretch. 45 tons is what Saturn V launched to the moon. Now, what you saw me doing there was checking that if we continue burning in this direction right now, we would hit the moon. And so it's fine to have a high apoapsis here. But we'll go around again and start burning, as you can see, as we approach Mexico here. And so we'll burn through we'll burn through the same point basically and extend our apoapsis further. You can see the translunar injection doesn't cost the normal 3100 that it would because our apoapsis has been extended uh, in that direction. So we've got the full benefit of that high orbit. And here we are passing over Florida as the second stage runs out and that's unfortunate because in order to make this mission work out we really wanted to complete the translunar injection with the second stage, but that's not what happened. I used the little Ullage rockets on the second stage because we're not going to use it for anything else. I don't use up the second stage's RCS because that would take too long. And I released the payload with its Estus engines and unlock that fuel, and here we go. So at this point, it's not looking particularly good for landing on the moon. You can see that this stage that we have attached here, this Estes stage, has about 2,400 meters per second. The fuel on the, on the ISRU test is locked currently. But uh, when you do the calculations, you need about 800 for lunar orbit. Then you need 2,600 to land. So it all depends on how much delta V we have in the ISRU unit. Here I extend the solar panels on the test unit. Those huge solar panels are the only ones I put there. I didn't put little small solar panels, so we have to do the full extension thing with the infernal robotics parts and the unfurling of those solar panels. So there we go. That's what it looks like plenty of power for its drilling purposes. And here we continue out to the moon. Not much fuel to spare really. And as we get closer and closer I continue burning the engines and of course as usual fine adjustments will be made using RCS but I get it pretty close just on the SS engines. And so there we have that. And just a little, a few taps with the RCS does the job. Okay, so there we go. And I go back to the SBH to check how much delta V this actually has. It has 1,100 meters per second. In total, to land it, we still need 3,400, and what we actually have is about 2,700, 2,800. Now, you'll note uh, another problem we had is that the ISR unit decided to shrink. What, uh, what I've done is I've scaled the stuff up to match realism overhaul and so what it has done is it's shrunk, shrunk to its previous size, its original size and the reason for that is I made it the root part and if you increase thing, if you scale things up the way I did you should not make them the root part and so people in chat, I forgot who it was again uh, mentioned that to me and that is indeed the case, that's the problem there anyway I bring it into lunar orbit anyway, so first we have to do a minor correction burn. Yeah, so uh, not entirely sure whether this was critical, the fact that the ISRU unit uh, rescaled itself. It's possible also that my rescaling of the controller unit was a problem. I'm not sure. That might have caused some of the problems that we'll see in the next episode. But uh, here we have the actual lunar orbit insertion burn. And uh, that's what it looked like. Five Estes engines. Estes is the upper stage engine for the Ariane system. Okay, and we get to orbit, and of course we'll want a fairly low orbit because we're ultimately aiming to land this thing, but we'll also need to refuel it now. So the goal will be to send over some fuel to refuel that Estes stage, and as Estes as 
A-E-S-T-U-S. I don't know how else to pronounce it, but uh, there we have it. And that's the end of that burn. So, so in the next episode, the uh, one of the main goals will be to refuel the stage and try to get it on the surface. But as I've mentioned, that, is, that ends up being trickier than I, at this point, think. And, uh, yeah, but anyway, we'll save that for next time. For now, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.